So during our Essential Jesus series, we've been going through the Beatitudes found in Matthew 5. And they talk about the blessed life, the good life that can be found in Christ. Last month, Pastor Kate shared with us that the good life is for those who are poor in spirit because they will inherit the kingdom. The Beatitudes, though, are uncomfortable, they're countercultural, and they're surprising because they call things blessed that we would sort of think, well, that doesn't sound very blessed. How can the poor in spirit be blessed? Well, they're blessed because they have the humility needed to see their deep need of God. And today we're on the second beatitude, which you can find if you turn with me to Matthew 5, verses 4. So let's look at Matthew 5, verses 4. It says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now that's kind of countercultural, isn't it? You sort of expect in our culture, blessed are those who are happy all the time. But Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. Have you ever been to a funeral or lost someone that you cared deeply about? It doesn't seem blessed is the right word to use when someone is mourning the loss of a loved one. We're scandalized by the idea that those who are mourn are called blessed by Jesus. So what exactly is this passage trying to tell us? The title of today's sermon is The Good Life, The Mourning Edition. And it's a play on words. We're using mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, instead of mourning, M-O-R-N-I-N-G. And Michael Card says, perhaps what links those two words together is the fact that they both represent moments when we wake up. Clearly, mourning, M-O-R-N-I-N-G, is the time when we open our eyes to the hope of a new day. But in another sense, a deeper sense, a time of mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, can also be an occasion when we come to our senses and with new, tear-cleansed eyes, we see the world like we've never seen it before. So what does it mean to mourn? If you've ever lost a loved one, you know that the pain you feel takes you by surprise because it's so unbelievably hard. It hurts so much. And it can feel different with each separate loss. Grief are those inward feelings we have when we experience loss. Mourning is the outward expression of that grief. And our Western culture is not very good at mourning. Funerals have gotten shorter and shorter. We now call them celebrations of life. And there's nothing wrong with celebrating the life of the person that we lost. But we have to give ourselves permission and time to mourn them. Death is still our enemy. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says it is the last enemy that will be destroyed. But death is here because of sin. And when someone that we love dies, we're sad because they're no longer with us. And we miss them deeply, even if we know they're with Jesus. So when you're sitting with that grieving person, 
Don't offer platitudes. We want to try and make it seem okay for that person. It's fine. They're with Jesus. You can have another baby. Or just the things we say. They're dumb. They're dumb. They don't help anybody. But we don't like sitting in pain. But the best thing you can do for someone who's lost a loved one, sit with them in their pain. Cry with them. Comfort them with your presence. You don't even need to say anything. Just hold their hand. Love them. That is the best gift you can give to someone when they've lost a loved one. The problem is we just don't like to sit in sadness and grief. We want to be happy all the time. And yet it is in the sadness and in the grief that we learn to number our days. And it tells us in Psalm 90 verses 12, when we learn to number our days, we gain a heart of wisdom. When we lose someone that we love, we come face to face with the reality of death. That our days in this life and this body are numbered. We have to face that life will end. But we also realize, and we gain this wisdom when we realize that how we live this life will determine our eternal destiny. And we gain this ability to see things differently after truly mourning. We see things with new eyes, eternal eyes, if we allow God to show us. And it's through that mourning process that we learn to negotiate with the loss. The loss is always going to be there, but we negotiate with that loss. And we come to accept and learn how to live with that loss in our life. If you have just lost a loved one recently or in the past, feel free to join us for Grief Share. We're starting today, right after the service. I'm heading over to Danforth, and we will be there until the end of June. Every Sunday at 1 p.m., we'll have lunch. We'll watch a video with some useful information on grief, and then we'll have time to share and to mourn together and to find healing and hope together. God does comfort those who mourn the loss of a loved one, but this verse has a deeper meaning than simply physical loss of a loved one. Although that does apply, The second B attitude actually complements the first one because it's when we understand that we are poor in spirit. When we understand the true depth of our poverty and need for God, it is then and only then that we truly mourn over our sin. We mourn over the world's sin, We mourn over the brokenness that it has brought into our lives and this world. It is only when we recognize the weight of our sins, when we recognize our true spiritual bankruptcy, that we can truly respond with sorrow. And I know it's true in my own life. It's been in the hard times. You know those times when you've lost a loved one? Maybe you've lost a job or a home. A friend of mine just lost her home in a fire. Or when you get a terminal diagnosis. Or a life-altering diagnosis. Maybe your spouse just left you or cheated on you. Or a friend has betrayed you. And it's in those hard times that we come to the end of ourselves 
It's in those times that we realize the true depth of our need for God. It's during those times that you think, but for the grace of God, I don't think I would make it through this. For the grace of God, I don't think I'd get through another day. And God's grace is good news. It is the best news ever. But it can never make us forget the weight of sin. Grace does not make sin less evil or less weighty. It actually makes it more so. Because the depth of sin and evil that it has brought into this world, the depth and the destruction it's brought into this world is why we need grace. And God's grace is the only thing that can rescue us from the penalty of our sins. So it is important for us to mourn, to cry and to feel sorrow about the sin in our own lives and in this world and the suffering and the death which sin spreads. It's important to mourn over those losses because it helps us to die to that life that we thought we deserved and we should have and instead to live the life that God has for us. And this mourning is not simply feeling bad or sorry that you got caught or maybe upset about the consequences you brought into your life because of your sin. It is a condition of our heart. It's just a lament, a word we don't hear very often in our culture, a cry of deeply felt sorrow for our spiritual bankruptcy, individually and corporately. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 7, verses 10. It should come up on the screen behind me. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 10 says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. But worldly grief produces death. Now it's important to remember, godly sorrow does not lead to feelings of shame and I'm so bad, I'm so terrible. Because remember, Romans 8.1, there is now no condemnation for anyone who is in Christ Jesus. Timothy Keller said, fear-based repentance makes us hate ourselves, whereas joy-based repentance makes us hate the sin. Worldly grief makes us feel sorry for ourselves. We're sorry we got caught, or we feel anger, or we feel shamed about ourselves. How could I have done that? But the problem with that is they both turn us inward to focus on self, to feel sorry for ourselves, or to feel sorry that we got caught. On the other hand, godly sorrow produces in us a hatred for sin, not ourselves, and a desire to no longer want to be trapped and deceived by sin's deceitfulness. It turns us toward God and His grace. It helps us see sin for what it really is. It's a trap that wants to keep us in bondage. It looks good on the outside, that shiny apple looks so good until you take a bite into it and realize it's full of worms. But godly sorrow helps us to see sin for what it truly is. We properly see sin as the enemy, not the person. Sin is the enemy trying to destroy your friendships, your oneness, 
the destructive force that's trying to destroy us and this world is sin. And then we come to accept Christ's sacrifice to pay the price we owe for sin and we take God's side against sin in our lives and in this world. And that's why those who mourn are called blessed. Because they recognize their deep need for God. And they are saddened by the pain and the sorrow that sin is causing in our world. They're blessed because it causes them to truly mourn, to feel sorrow over the sins of this world, their own sins. Their tears cause them to see sin for what it really is. And that leads to blessing. It leads to new eyes that see things from an eternal perspective. So the blessing is not a shallow, temporary feeling of happiness. It's a deep-rooted, in-your-gut joy that doesn't change with circumstances. Doesn't matter what you're going through. You have the joy of the Lord. James 4, 8 to 10 says, Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Because when we do, we humble ourselves before the Lord. And he will exalt us. We can be comforted even when we're mourning over our sin because in that mourning, we are drawing closer to God. He just comes to us. And the weeping is not only sorrow over sin, but it is a form of longing for the eternal, including the future resurrection of the dead. The mourners are those who pray for God's kingdom to come because they feel the agony of its partial absence. They feel that God's kingdom is here, but not fully yet. An awareness of our sin drives us to God. It tells us the kingdom of God is not for the person of faith who makes a profession of faith as if they're doing God a favor. It is for the person who constantly recognizes their impoverished state and approach God on no other ground than that of need. I know I need God every single day. Psalm 119.36 shows us what this deep sorrow over sin looks like. It says, streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. Because when they're saying this, they know those moments of mourning when we feel, yes, Sin is here and it is causing suffering. It is causing dying. It is causing disease. It is causing mental illness. It is causing chaos because we have chosen to sin against God and not obey. And we have all done it. And our world continues to, and so death and suffering and evil continue to rob and steal joy from people. And this morning covers a global as well as a personal view of sin and our participation in it. And I know it seems kind of gloomy. Here it is my birthday and I'm talking about something that sounds a little depressing. <laughs> you know? But it's good for us 
to feel the weight of it from time to time. To grieve over the lost who need a shepherd to guide them. To plead with God to help us get over ourselves and our fears so that we reach out to others with love and we share the good news without fear because people need it. It's essential. Now, I'm not saying that means we need to go around with long faces all the time as Christians and be sad all the time. But we need to create moments in our lives. These times of mourning, when we allow ourselves to think about the sin and the sadness of this world. And we're not very good at that. Think about when was the last time you sat and allowed yourself to feel deep sorrow over the sin and the brokenness in our world. I was thinking about this yesterday and then I was out for my prayer walk and tears were flowing from my eyes and I thought, well, I must look pretty silly to everybody walking by me. But the pain of it, the sorrow of it just overwhelmed me because I hate to watch the news. Honestly, I hate all the bad news you hear. It's a little bit depressing. But you know what? That doesn't give me an excuse to avoid thinking about and being sad by the evil in this world. Because I know that even though I don't like to dwell on the bad stuff, I'm aware that it has been in the darkest moments of my life when I've truly felt loss, when I've been deep in mourning over something that I have felt God's presence the most. He has given me new eyes during that time. He has made me aware that I need him in my life every single moment of every single day. And that is a blessing. We need to have an attitude like Isaiah who said, woe is me, I'm a wretched man. We can't be laughing at our sins like our culture does. We need to be the ones weeping over our sins and the sins of our culture because they are what caused our Jesus to have to die for us. And this is not a shameful woe is me weeping, but a deep sorrow over the pain that sin has brought into our lives and the lives of others and all the pain that it's causing. Sorrow that our Savior had to die to pay the price for our sins which should lead us to a desire for Christ to return. Come, Lord Jesus, should be our prayer because we know when he comes back, sin will once and for all be defeated. There's going to be no more death, no more sin, and no more sorrow. And these first two Beatitudes deliberately allude to the messianic blessings of Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3. The Messiah is going to bring the oil of gladness instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of despair. Now these blessings were partially realized already, but they're only going to be fully realized when Christ returns, we're told in Revelation 7:17. 7, and they depend on the Messiah who has come already to save us from our sins. So how are we comforted? When we truly understand the depth of our spiritual bankruptcy, when we truly understand our need for God, we are able to look to God for his grace to save us. And it's through God's grace that we experience comfort and joy because he has forgiven us of all our sins. There is a time for us to mourn over our sins and the fallenness of this broken world. 
we receive comfort from the fact that Christ came to pay the price for our sins. And it's through God's grace that we are saved from our sins. And that is such good news. We don't need to pay the price for them. It's a gift. We're freely forgiven and welcomed into God's family when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. And it's in this morning that the good life starts. The life of salvation. The life of freedom. And the promise of the future when it will be, will be fully realized. That's where our joy comes from. Worship team, could you please come back up and help me? The good life starts in the morning because it turns us to God for comfort. If you have never experienced this good life, if you've never mourned over your sin, you can today. If you are finally seeing that you need a savior, that you need God in your life, you can ask him for forgiveness for your sins. You can ask him to come into your life and be your leader from now on. And if that is you today, I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer that's going to come up on the screen. But you know what? I want all of us to say it. Because I think it's a good reminder to all of us. No matter how long you've been saved, we still need Jesus every day. We still need to be confessing our sins and asking God to change us. So let's say this prayer. You can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for, to pay the price for my sins. I am deeply sorry for the sins I have committed. Please forgive me of my sins and help me to live for you from now on. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, welcome into the family of God. And we would love to help you get started on your walk with Jesus. So you can fill out a Connect card, as Pastor Godfrey mentioned. You can find them in front of you or online at connect.mystone.ca. The reason we want to do it is because we want to help you on your walk with God. And part of that, we have Grow Night, which was mentioned in the advertisements, where we come together on, when, on Tuesday evenings, starting April 16th. We're going to be here at this campus. And if you're new to faith or exploring, or maybe you couldn't say that prayer today, but you have questions, come on out and join us. We start with a meal, and then you can go to Alpha, which is a great place to explore your faith or to learn the basics of faith. And maybe you're a little further along that journey. Well, come on out and join us for next steps. Take that next step in your faith. And if you're a fairly grounded Christian and you're ready to take responsibility for your spiritual growth, come and join us for our Way Discipleship Group where you can grow and learn how to help and reach others for Christ. You can find out all about it at events.mystone.ca. Click on Grow Night. The thing is, is we all need each other to grow. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. It says he's the paraclete. And it is the presence of the Holy Spirit which comforts us and helps us now. He comforts us during trials, but he also assures us of our salvation. And we also experience comfort in our suffering. Do we not? Comfort in our pain? Because we have the Holy Spirit in us. The presence of Jesus who will never leave us, no matter what circumstance we're going through. 
He won't leave us not just in the effects of sin, our own sin, but in the effects of living in a fallen world. He is with you in illness. His presence is with you in addiction. His presence is with you in abandonment and depression. And whatever you are going through, God is with you. His comfort is promised to each and every one of us. It doesn't come when we dull or deny our pain or try and pretend it's not there. But this comfort comes when we face our pain. When we see that Jesus' face is right there with us in that pain. That is what brings hope. And that hope and that comfort we get, we share it with others. And we give them the same comfort that we have received from God. It tells us that in 2 Corinthians 1.14. There will be complete comfort when Christ returns. The days of mourning are coming to an end. Once and for all, yes, let's cheer because that is good news. God is going to wipe away all of our tears. Revelation 21, 4 says, He will wipe every tear from your eye. There will be no more mourning, no more crying. Can you imagine? No more pain. Hallelujah. For the old order of things has passed away. And comfort in the biblical sense is not just, oh dear, dear, a pat on the back. It's apocalyptic. It's the remaking of the old age into the new age where there are no more tears. There's a partial comfort now that's going to be completely filled when Christ returns. And that's why we say, come Lord Jesus, come. The good life starts in the morning because it gives us new eyes to see things from God's perspective and hearts that long, long for Christ's return to come and complete those promises.